welcome to the Annie E. Casey Foundation podcast, a monthly conversation focusing on how all of us can work together to build a brighter future for kids, families, and communities. I'm Lisa Hamilton, Vice President of External Affairs at the Foundation. I'm delighted to be your host, and I'm so glad you've joined us for a hopefully inspiring and interesting conversation today. The Casey Foundation is focused on giving kids what they need, strong families, vibrant communities, and financial stability. In these efforts, the Foundation is fortunate to work with innovators who develop, test, and implement solutions to help kids thrive. Each month, we'll bring you an in-depth conversation with one of these experts right here on the Casey Foundation Podcast. President Johnson launched the War on Poverty in the mid-1960s with a set of bold federal policies. By the turn of this century, however, very few political candidates were discussing issues involving poverty or economic mobility, and possible solutions were not part of the national conversation. Yet the Great Recession brought new attention to the ever-growing number of Americans who are struggling to make ends meet. At the end of 2015, two leading think tanks, the American Enterprise Institute and Brookings Institution, partnered to release an important new report, Opportunity, Responsibility, and Security, a consensus plan for reducing poverty and restoring the American dream. One of the report's lead authors is today's guest, Ron Haskins, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. A former White House and congressional advisor on welfare issues, Ron co-directs the Brookings Center on Children and Families and is also a consultant with the Casey Foundation. He's an expert on preschool, foster care, and poverty, and he was instrumental in the 1996 overhaul of national welfare policy. We're delighted to have Ron join us today. How are you doing? Welcome. I'm doing fine. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Great. Well, let's start by talking about uh, how children are doing in terms of their economic well-being. Uh, in June, the Casey Foundation released its 2016 Kids Count Data Book, which annually ranks states on 16 different indicators of child well-being. And while we see progress in many areas such as health and education, the economic condition of children in low-income families is simply not improving. Ron, could you tell us why that is? Yes. Um, I think that, uh, there are a host of reasons. You could probably get up to six or seven different reasons, but I think there are three especially important things, and they have to do with the organization of this report uh, that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Probably the single biggest factor is the historic increase in single parent families, especially female headed families. The reason that's so important is that the probability that a child will be in poverty is five times as great in a single parent family as it is in a married couple family. So if you're in effect, what we have been doing is reducing the percentage of our kids who are in the family uh, the family composition in which they're least likely to be in poverty, namely married parents, and into the situation where they're most likely to be in poverty, namely a uh, single parent and female headed families. So in, if you think about this for a minute, government policy could be effective, more people could work, a lot of factors could be going on that would reduce poverty, put downward pressure on poverty, and the poverty rate would still go up because so many kids are going into are going into low-income families. And then secondly, of course, the recession uh, w was a tremendous, uh, had a tremendous impact on families, especially low-income families and especially female-headed families. Uh, so that that's another, that's the major source of income in these families is earnings. Uh, so if unemployment increases, and as a result of that, some moms and others dropped out of the labor force. So work is another very big issue uh, in poverty. And then in the long run, maybe the most important issue of all, not in the short run, but in the long run, is education. And we, this is a very great weakness in America, especially for kids from low-income families, and that is that we, they, their education is poor, um, not enough of them have the skills to go to four-year colleges, 
A lot of them do have the skills to go to two-year colleges and, and earn other certificates for work. We'll talk about that more later. But all three of these areas, the family, work, and in the long run, especially education, are all problematic. And until we attack these and are more successful than we are now, we're going to have very high rates of child poverty. The second reason you mentioned is work. What shifts have we seen in the type of job that pays enough to support a family and the qualifications needed to get those jobs? Let me make a distinction here. There are low-income jobs, basically service sector jobs, $10, $11, $12 an hour. And then there are so-called middle skill jobs. Uh, and these are jobs that you need a skill. Generally, though, you do not need a four-year degree. And often you don't need a two-year degree, but a, a skill like plumbing or electrician, uh, medical technician, those jobs are growing uh, rapidly. There is a big fight over whether those middle skill jobs are declining. And some of the best experts in this area, especially Harry Holzer of Georgetown University and Bob Lerman of American University have done a very careful analysis. And I think most economists agree with them that we are, for the foreseeable future, we are gonna have a lot of these middle skill jobs that people could make up to 50, 60, 70,000 a year, which would take them way above poverty. Um, but those, the types of jobs have shifted. So the computer technician, um, um, as I said, medical technician, the kind of jobs are, are, have changed and manufacturing is, is declining and other middle, so-called middle skill jobs are declining. So there are problems in the economy and we definitely, this is a major point, we definitely have a situation where if a family is gonna earn 40 or 50 or 60,000 a year, in most cases a high school degree will not do. We can get a lot of kids through high school. High school graduation rates have been improving, but they're not necessarily gonna get good jobs. And to support a family, even a single parent family, you need a better job. So this mismatch between the jobs available in the economy and the education that low-income families are getting is a problem. By the way, we're learning a lot about how to help uh, people get the kind of certificates and other qualifications that they need for these jobs. And we've had several very good studies that, in, you know, very scientific studies implemented in multiple sites over a period of years or with long-term follow-up. And we are, we've learned a lot about how to help people get into those jobs. So part of it is that we're just, we're not doing the right thing. We're not doing enough of the right thing. We could have a big impact on poverty, even though we've had these big changes in American economy. And even though because of technology and international competition, the kind of jobs that you need uh, to escape poverty and be well above the poverty level uh, involve skills. So Ron, let's talk about what uh, this level of poverty means for uh, children. Uh, our Kids Count data book uh, lets us know that you know a quarter of kids are growing up below the federal poverty level and nearly half of them are growing up in low-income families. What's the consequence of this on their development and their future prospects? I have noticed over the years that developmental psychologists who are probably the primary group that studies this issue uh, disagree on many, many, many things, but they do not disagree generally on this issue. They believe that poverty is bad for children. I think almost everybody believes that. If a family is in poverty for six months because they lost a job or maybe they had a child they didn't expect, you know, various crises that families have to face, that is not too bad. What really hurts is when a kid, two things. One, when a very young child, say under age three, it, there's a lot of evidence now that they are more sensitive uh, to living in poverty than, than older children are. And secondly, long-term poverty is especially difficult. So if a, st if a child is the worst of all situations would be a child born into poverty and lived in poverty for a, a significant fraction of their life. And poverty is kind of like a, it's kind of like a disease in some ways. Once you get it, the probability that a family will have it for a long time, or even if they get out, they fall back and they keep falling back into poverty. It's, it's, and so that is exactly the kind of thing that's, uh, that's difficult for, for children's development. You've already mentioned how changes in family structure and the economy have impacted child poverty and outcomes. Are there any other factors? 
Another factor that a lot of people cite is that we've had a huge increase in inequality in America. Now, that's mostly between the top of the distribution and the rest of the distribution, um, and not so much between the middle and the bottom. But there's still research that suggests that the increasing in, uh, inequality has had an impact on families at the bottom. I think the evidence for that is weaker than the evidence for the other factors that we're discussing here. Um, there are still racial and economic and uh, ethnic differences in poverty rates uh, with minorities, uh, blacks and Hispanics and others, except Asians, uh, are much more likely to be in poverty than, than white uh, kids are. But it, this is a very interesting thing. In education, the gaps between, between ethnic groups have declined somewhat, and they've done it pretty consistently over a fairly long period of time. And meanwhile, the gaps between kids from low-income families and middle-income families and upper-income families have been growing, and they've been growing for at least 20 years, probably longer. And there's a, uh, there are studies that show that these gaps uh, show up in many, many different longitudinal data sets that are kept on kids from early in their life until later in their life. So I think very few people doubt this, that this educational gap has closed somewhat for ethnic groups and racial groups, but it has opened wider for income groups, and that's what really concerns us. Uh, and that's a, one of the reasons that it's so difficult. So, Ron, with that context, let's switch to a conversation about some solutions. Uh, in the report, you've provided some bipartisan uh, recommendations about what we can do to address this situation. What does it mean for the viability of the solutions that they were developed on a bipartisan basis? Everybody knows that there's a lot of trouble in Washington nowadays. Uh, there's more partisanship than there's been in many years. It's very difficult to pass legislation. The phrase, do nothing, Congress is everywhere. Uh, the president and the Congress agree on very few things. So it's very important in an environment like this to propose things that there are elements, at least, of what you propose that both sides could agree to. And it can be done, it has been done. There has been a fair amount of legislation passed in the last two years that, that concerns children. Uh, we passed legislation on child protection, the area of abuse and neglect. Uh, we passed very good legislation on education, very good legislation on preschool programs. So it is possible to do it. So we had the idea that if we could assemble a group of half progressive slash liberal uh, scholars, many of whom have had experience in government, and half, in this case, eight conservatives that also are noted scholars and many of whom have had experience in government. And if we could, if we could hammer out an agreement that both sides would have to swallow hard on some of the things that the other side wants, but if we could do that, and write a report that was coherent and well-written and fairly short uh, that we might be able to have an in, impact on the policy process. Now, I've been a part of the policy process for many, many years, both in the Congress and uh, in the White House, and I know how hard it is. I'm not naive, and there was no one in the group that was naive, but we thought, given how partisan the situation is in Washington, it was really worth a try. And, of course, we didn't know if we could actually hammer out agreement, and we did handle it. We met five times for a day each time in New York and Washington. There were 16 members of the group. The attendance was terrific, wonderful discussions. As we got down toward the end, it was, you know, we had, we had some fairly pointed sessions. But we did hammer on an agreement. So, for example, the left does not particularly like to talk about marriage as one of the causes of poverty and a lack of mobility in the U.S., and they agreed to do it. Where There are several stipulations involved. We have to emphasize that stability is probably the most cru crucial element, and you could have stability without having a two-parent family, uh, especially if you had cohabitation, but um, we agreed to that. And on the other side, conservatives agreed to minimum wage, which is probably the issue that the conservatives are most united against. So both sides had to give. So our thought was that when we published the report and we emphasize this, that Congress, uh, Congress should be able to look at that report and say, well, here's something I don't like, but here's something I do. And we thought that that would advance the debate and show that it could be done. 
Well, great. Well, let's talk about some of those recommendations. You frame the report around three core topics, family, work, and education. So let's talk about each and understand some of the solutions that the working group put forward. So first, in the area of family. So in each of these three areas, we had four major recommendations and then some quite specific things in case Congress actually decided to adopt some of these, the people who have drafted the legislation want to have some hints about uh, specifically what we want. So in the area of family, the four recommendations are that we should promote marriage and stability in the children's living arrangement. Um, secondly, that we should have responsible childbearing, which means that we should have much more use of birth control and it should especially be available to low-income families and we've got all kinds of specific ideas and report about that third parenting skills are crucial we now have a lot of studies showing that parents and the time they spend with a child and reading to the child and involved in discussions with a child have a big impact on the child's development not just during uh, the preschool years but uh, well into childhood and we have good studies that show that parents most parents really would like to improve and that they can improve and it has an impact on the children. So it's very promising that we could do more things there. And then finally, there's a huge problem with young men, especially minority young men. And in fact, there are a lot of theories out there that say that a lot of young women, especially minority young women, do not get married. They have babies outside marriage, uh, but they do not get married because they don't have a very good choice set. A lot of the guys are in prison or they're poorly educated. Uh, there are a lot of problems with young men, so we have a whole set of recommendations about things that we could do uh, that would help young men do better in school and be more likely to get employment. And we proposed, one of our biggest proposals was that we would subsidize the earnings of young men to provide a lure to get them uh, into the job market, and that might help improve marriage rates or the stability of cohabitation rates. So what about uh, your recommendations under the uh, category of work? work is an interesting area not least because we had a lot of agreement among the members of our of our working group on this area uh, I'm going to mention three of the specific of the recommendations that we made one is to expand opportunities uh, for the disadvantaged by improving their skills and this is an area that I think is uh, uh, very hot right now out in the countryside uh, there are a lot of states and a lot of localities that are trying to uh, to incorporate training both during the public school years and following and training this is a key for jobs that are available in the local economy um, and do not require a four-year degree so sometimes it's some it could be an internship uh, it, it could be some sort of uh, training program that leads to a certificate but the key is it's not a four-year degree and even kids who did not necessarily shine in high school, could do well uh, in, uh, expanding their opportunities in, uh, for skilled training. Uh, the second area is to expand work requirements in federal programs, but here we had a long debate about the current TANF program, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, which can throw people off the rolls, can throw single mothers off the rolls if they don't meet the work requirements and also if they've hit a time limit. And of course, the, the members of our group who were progressive uh, did not like that. That's something that a lot of progressives don't like. It was a, it's something they argued against strongly in welfare reform. So we made a compromise that no person could lose benefits because of these kind of work requirements. Uh, and if we expand the work requirements to the food stamp and housing programs, that no person could lose benefits unless they had been offered an actual job. Uh, so that, from the perspective of people on the left, made a lot of sense. They're not against work, they think people should work, they want them to work more, but they don't want anybody thrown off the rolls uh, because they didn't get a job if there's no job available. Uh, and so the next recommendation, of course, was to make more jobs available and the states would have some probably some choices here uh, but they might run a program in which they're actually uh, supplying something like public jobs for at least a period of time until people can find their own job and finally what were the recommendations that the working group had around education 
we have a, a number of recommendations in education, but I want to focus on two, uh, mainly because they're so popular. The, the, the two areas that we thought really needed, first had a lot of evidence that they worked, but then need some serious attention, are public investments in preschool and in post-secondary. And we do actually have a lot of evidence in both of these areas that they can work well. Uh, preschool can prepare kid, kids for the public schools. Uh, they can result in them behaving better in the public schools. We have a number of studies that have shown long-term impacts all the way into adulthood. Um, but generally, in programs like Head Start, uh, and even some state pre-K programs, we don't get those kind of long-term benefits, and even some fairly rapid disappearance of the benefits from short-term. So we want to focus on that area. We want to make sure that we do everything we can to have powerful impacts during the preschool years and kids learn enough so that they can do well in the public schools and maybe that would feed on itself. And then for the area of post-secondary education, uh, we wanted to, we have a number of recommendations again, but one of the most interesting was to base state funding, states give money to uh, both two-year and four-year colleges, and we wanted to make that money, at least part of it, contingent on their actual performance. So the two-year schools and the four-year schools would be evaluated in effect, uh, and their, their pay, their, their reimbursement from the state would be based in part on how well they do. And what that means is the number of students who complete whatever their degree course is, the number of students who actually get a job, and the wages they get in those jobs. Now, that may seem like pretty complex, complex undertaking and would take a lot of money and a lot of time to gather those data, but m most states have that data already. So this is, a, this is kind of the new wave in program evaluation that use administrative data whenever you can. First of all, you have it on more people. In many cases, it's more reliable, but above all, you have it on so many people uh, and you don't have to do anything additional to get it. Uh, so we want the states to be able to access that data and use it to evaluate what happens to their kids. Do they actually finish? And then do they get a job and how much do they earn in that job? And then in turn, their reimbursement from the state would be based on their performance, which we think is a very strong idea. So that's a, those aren't all of our recommendations, but uh, that's a, most of our most interesting uh, recommendations uh, in the areas of family and work and education. Thanks for joining us today, Ron. And I want to thank our listeners for joining as well. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, rate our podcast on iTunes to help others find us. To learn more about our podcast and for show notes, visit our website, aecf.org, and follow the Casey Foundation on Twitter at AECF News. Until next time, I wish all of America's kids and all of you a bright future.